Welcome to Pedo Teeth Talk, brought to you by the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, a show that delivers cutting-edge ideas for the professional specializing in pediatric dentistry and promotes the highest standards of patient care with today's top experts in the field. Now here's your host, Dr. Joel Berg. Thank you for tuning in to Pedo Teeth Talk, where we bring you the contemporary issues important to you and your practice. Brought to you by the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. And thank you to our Pedo Teeth Talk sponsor, Hugh Freedy, for helping us bring you great content. We couldn't do this without them. Visit them at www.hughfreedy.com. That's H-U-F-R-I-E-D-Y.com. We're here today with Dr. Christina Carter. Dr. Carter earned her BS in molecular biology from Haverford College, where she was captain of the fencing team. She was rookie of the year and qualified individually for the NCAA tournament. She returned to New Jersey for dental school and was honored with earning the American Academy of Dentistry for Children Award and the Pierre Frichard Award and other awards. Following graduation, she moved to New York City, where she completed her pediatric dentistry residency and served as chief resident at NYU College of Dentistry. She continued her training by completing an additional residency in orthodontics and dental facial orthopedics at NYU. During this time, she loved treating patients with special needs and decided to spend another year in advanced training. She completed the Fellowship in Cleft Craniofacial and Surgical Orthodontics at the world-renowned Institute of Reconstructive Plastic Surgery at NYU Langone Medical Center. After nine years of training post-college, she decided, okay, that's enough for the moment. And she is, I would say, one of a very small group of doctors with comprehensive training of this sort in the country. She is past president of the AA, she is past president of the um, AAO uh, Northeastern Society of the AAO. She is the, th- the third largest region of the American Association of Orthodontists. She is one of eight people to serve on the AAO Council of Orthodontic Healthcare. This group helps bring orthodontic care to children who cannot afford braces but need care. In her spare time, she loves playing with her toy poodle, Kelly, who is a certified therapy dog and AKC canine good citizen. Dr. Carter, I'll tell the audience your bio is impressive and there's a lot more online they can visualize. But today, I just, I just want to thank you for spending a few minutes with us on Pedo Teeth Talk. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Well, as I said, you have an impressive background. I'd love to talk all day with you and more. But today we have a short time. So I'm going to get down to a few points that you and I, that you shared with me that, you know, you being a dual trained or actually triple trained in this area that's important to all of us in pediatric dentistry, uh, some pearls, some some things that are really important in your mind because you're a practitioner in both areas. So let's start with class three treatment. You know, all of us have education and growth and development as pediatric dentists. We get, sometimes we train together with the orthodontic residents, but this is one of these areas that because we don't deal with it that often in terms of treatment, we see it all the time. So what are your tips and spend a couple of minutes with us telling us about class three treatment in your eyes? I know it's a global question and, you know, but just some of the high points. So everybody kind of fears the class three patient and we're always taught wait, wait, wait because they're going to need surgery. But we're finding that with earlier treatment um, at four and five, if the patient can actually tolerate and sit in the chair and sit for full records, not every patient can do that, but the ones that can really are rock stars. And um, we find that we can really work with growth even before any of the adult teeth come in and protract that maxilla and slide it forward um, with uh, protraction headgear or other um, other methods. I don't want to lock us into one treatment modality. There's so many different ways to get to the same place, especially in orthodontics, but working with growth and promoting um, those open sutures to slide to a better position really benefits the patient. And not only is it better for occlusion, oftentimes it helps with airway. And we know that that's such a hot topic right now. I don't really want to get into airway per se, but when we bring that forward, what's posterior opens up and has more space. Um, And I 
always uh, consult with speech therapy because we are changing that posterior area, especially with children with clefts. We want to make sure that we're not opening up another problem with velopharyngeal insufficiency. Um, but we can slide that maxilla forward. Would they wear it at home and when they sleep? And at this point, when they're at that age, they sleep for 10, 12 hours a day. Compliance is super easy. And we also know that the uh, looking different to other children their age is not as big a factor. When you're in middle school, that bullying factor kicks in. But at that age, they don't really notice the differences or see the differences in the same way. So when you say that age, um, if I see a, a, a three-year-old who has a, a crossbite, uh, um, well, you know, has, has a class three, let's say, and uh, I see it both in the jaw and I see it in the dentition, should I refer to you at that age, at three or four or when? Sure. So I actually say, come see me as soon as you see it. We can evaluate the child's, you know, growth and development, but also it gets the child used to the office. And I don't know many orthodontists that are really upset when they see a patient too early. And sometimes those children, especially if they're the second sibling or the third sibling, they're so used to coming that they're ready. Um, right. And they, we don't want to just assume that they cannot tolerate treatment. You know, sometimes those three, four, five, six-year-olds, more four, three sometimes can be a little bit rough. Um, they are are sometimes way better and more compliant than our adolescents. Yeah. Well, you know, in, in my day, which is a while ago, and when I trained, they, they used to call what I think you're referring to here with this taking advantage of the growth and the jaw movement, and that we used to call this using functional appliances. Is that the term that are that is still applied to this, or is that different oh, today? Uh, it's a little different. Functional appliances is using the muscular skeletal components to actually help move things. So we are... And it's usually internal. With some protraction headgear or some movement of the maxilla forward, sometimes we're just using internal. There's nothing okay. external, and that would be a functional appliance. Um, okay. If we're using a face mask where we're actually connecting rubber bands to an external device, the true you know, definition is it's no longer a functional appliance. Okay. We're splitting hairs there you know, with definition. Yeah. Okay. Well, you can see why I wanted to talk all day, but I have to go to another topic already and uh, to move us along. Uh, so impacted canines, it's, we see it all the time. And, you know, we, we develop these techniques of deciding it comes an academic question at that point, you know, are they palatal? Are they lingual rather? Are they facial? You know, the, the, the same side, the slob rule, whatever it is. And <laughs> now we have comb beam CTs and blah, blah, blah. And I'm going to come to that topic in a minute. But um, so, when should we, once, when is it important to say, oh, there are impacted canines there, also see some space loss, you know, maybe I need to find out if they're impinging on the laterals, is there an eruption issue, impaction issue for other teeth? So just summarize for us, how should we assess this and when do we refer to you? Sure. So um, looking out for impacted canines is kind of my uh favorite little addiction. It's almost like I like notching my belt. Oh, there were two impacted canines and I was able to intercept them and bring them down without surgery. It's kind of like our little thing. I have to say you're the first person who's ever self-described an addiction to assessing impacted <laughs> canines, but I, I'm a fan. Go ahead. I'm sorry. So anytime we can intercept a problem, that's what I like to do. Um, but we take a screening, um, panoramic x-ray, usually after we seal the six-year molar, so about seven, you know, which is also the age that we say every child should be looked at by an orthodontist. And so when we look there, we look to see if um, the, if there is over the orientation of what we call the three, fours, and fives, the, uh, primary, the adult canines and first and second premolars. Is there any ectopic eruption of the sixes? What is the position of the second molars, adult second molars? And is there a lot of overlapping of those, of the adult dentition so that we know we have a space discrepancy? Is the angulation of the adult canines, upper and lower, mesialized? Um, do we see that they're in a poor position? When we look inside the mouth, does everything look very narrow? When I run my finger along the vestibule, along the buckle aspect of the gingiva, 
is there an indent in that canine area or not? And these are some of the things that um, we look for. I also ask parents, you know, oh, did you have orthodontics when you were younger? And it usually sparks, oh, I had an expander or, oh, I had those chains or, oh, I didn't have anything. You know, so you kind of get a, uh, a history too. While there is a genetic component, there's, it's not 100% genetic, but you kind of right. look twice. Um, and I find that while sometimes we're taught to just extract primary teeth to help guide teeth in, if we know why are these teeth in a bad position? If we know there's going to be crowding, why are we not expanding? So I know that we, some of the classic literature, um, especially out of Boston University, was you do not expand except in the presence of a crossbite. Well, that's not always the case. Um, sometimes we do wait because we have that uh, increase in transverse width once the laterals do erupt. But if we already know that we're crowded, why don't we make more room or at least increase the ability to get something to come in? If we know something's stuck, um, if we why don't we make more room? There's kind of a cardinal rule in orthodontics. If you think you have enough space to fit a tooth, you don't. And if you have a little bit too much space, it just might fit. So okay. if you know you're a little crowded, expand. You know, I'm not saying 100% of the time, but expand, make things wider, loosen up those teeth a little bit if you want them to kind of go in a different way. And we still extract primary teeth to help create right. roadways for them to come in. But, but it, it's, a more, it's a broader subject than just expanding a primary canids. A one lane. Yeah. yeah, that's... Well, there's a, there's a whole bunch more to this that I want to talk to you about another time on the treatment side. There's a lot of you know different ways of doing it. We're not going to have time today, so we'll we'll come back. That's that's one of many topics we'll follow up on. We will now pause for a word from our sponsor. Do you need additional CE hours but don't have time to travel to courses? Did you attend the annual session and want to listen to the audio recordings? Check out AAPD's Education Passport an online learning center where you can earn CE and listen to audio recordings from all of our continuing education courses and more. Visit educationpassport.aapd.org. We are back with Dr. Christina Carter. She is not more than dual trained in pedo ortho, also in craniofacial anomalies and cleft lip and palate and the related conditions that require assessment and treatment. So we were just talking about, we talked about class three treatments. We talked early about screening for impacted canines. For both of those kinds of assessments, we might want to do some of the modern imaging techniques. And of course, what comes to mind is cone beam CT. You know, back in the day it was we were doing hand tracing cephalograms and all that kind of stuff. And we're not going to get into that about, you know, whether that should, is still necessary. I, my answer is thinking is no, but because you could probably look at it. But then, so where does the cone beam CT fit into your practice? And maybe divide that into two parts. Where does it fit into your practice as an orthodontist? And do you think a pediatric dentist who maybe doesn't have an orthodontist in their practice needs such a device? But just to get your take on that. So I am, I have no financial, um, association with any of the CBCT companies, but I uh, think it's one of the things that's really revolutionized orthodontics and being able to treat. Um, I, when I have like my two different hats, my pediatric dental hat, it uh, does not impact pediatrics as much as orthodontics. However, in the cases where you might need it, or as a pediatric dentist, where you see a supernumerary, or if you see really something odd. If I didn't own mine, I would refer to my oral surgeon or refer to somebody else to have it. And, you know, for, but for my day to day screenings, I would not necessarily have it as a pediatric dentist. As an orthodontist, it has completely changed my uh, way to diagnose and to treatment plan. In fact, my, um, my ICAT was down this week. And I felt like I was doing things blind. It was really very mm -hmm. frustrating. I still have my pan Ceph, my old machine, just because it was a great machine. And I do straight pans too. But when I need to um, really look at bone, 
if, if I can mm -hmm. move deep into the area. Um, cephalometric, instead of just having a one angle, I can actually turn and see more facial asymmetries. It's no longer the lines don't really line up, but I can see, you know what, the orbits aren't as aligned. The, the asymmetry is really starting much higher than where I thought. I also have a much better view of the condyles. And that has been huge because I have diagnosed and, um, well, I don't want to say I have completely diagnosed, but I've identified problems with the joints referred to rheumatology and there was uh, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis starting. Um, so that's really been uh, really very different. Of course, with my cleft and craniofacial population, we've been using it for a while and I don't know how you treat without that. But um, as an orthodontist, I saw a little fuzziness on number eight up at the apical part and there's an open, it was a younger child and there was an open apex. And I was looking and I said, that's just really not right. And we took the CBCT and we rotated it and there was a mesia dense that was inverted and we saw it that way. Mm -hmm. And then um, in my peds uh, practice, and again, I would have referred this to an endodontist. I had a patient who was 16, no history of any caries had um, terrible pain, terrible pain, terrible pain up on the upper right in the anterior region. And on a lark, I turned to the mother and I said, you know, can I take this 3D imaging because something just doesn't feel right. And I, I know it's not sinuses because we did all that testing and it wasn't that. She had from a dens and vaginatus, a huge palatal uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I see that fairly often actually, it's not uncommon. Yeah. yeah, but I wouldn't have seen that with anything. Yeah. Sent it right off to the to the end yeah. and she was like, "This was crazy." You yeah. know, we've taken anterior PAs recently. You know, with our regular, you know, series of X-rays, and there was nothing. So it really does yeah. change. But one of the other things that's really wonderful is when we want to actually figure out how much space we need, we can measure accurately without any distortion the the space of all of the adult teeth that have not yet erupted. So the days of doing predictions of Tanaka Johnson and Moyer's analysis are gone. Mm -hmm. Oh man, why didn't they have this back when? I spent exactly. my life doing that. <laughs> exactly. Um, it almost feels like we study it. It really gives us real live, legit, accurate, you know. Well, I think this is another topic that I could spend a day with you on. So we're going to save imaging, not just cone beam, but imaging uh, for another session. And I think it's something we all have to get updated on, but you're the best person to ask because you're the both personalities and you see how it works and you can tell us what we need to know. So the last topic in our short time today is you, you would talk to me about something you're seeing with the growth of aligners that we're seeing this certain decay pattern. And as a result of seeing this decay pattern, you've implemented some like different preventive measures when you have patients in a liner, clear liner treatment. So tell us a little bit about that in the last moments. Sure. So I love it when my patients tell me, well, my friends with the, with the liners aren't told what you tell me. And we're really strict about not only brushing after every single thing that you eat or drink, um, but also what you drink while your liners are in. Oftentimes they were told anything clear they can drink. Well, we all know that the seltzers, the La Croix, the, you know, all the different flavored seltzers, which have no sugar and um, are no calories. And a lot of the kids are drinking it are just as acidic as soda. And so we're seeing a rise, not only of pit and fissure carries, but also smooth surfaces, the linguals, the buckles. So that's more of an erosion phenomenon then if it's acid, right? Than right. carries traditionally, yeah. Well, now that we are scanning instead of taking impressions, we have better fitting aligners. And when we have better fitting aligners, speech is not impacted as much because they fit so tightly, which means there's less saliva in between, which uh. makes the teeth dehydrate. So oh. if you're not brushing, you're putting something on dehydrating the teeth. Now, what do these kids, or at least in my area, what do they do? They After school, they go to Dunkin' Donuts, Starbucks, and they get these, you know, sugar-filled beverages. They drink them, and then they put their aligners back in. Or they drink them with their aligners in. So I applaud oh. them 
wearing their aligners, but they're basically packing sugar right on top of these, these, these teeth. So not only do we, are we very strict about what those rules are, but we always advocate using a Prevident at night, flossing, and then putting your aligners in. So we're actually packing that fluoride right on. It's almost like a fluoride treatment every night. So when you hear, you know, we hear about the importance, we tell as pediatric dentists, we talk to kids, oh, you've got braces on. It's even more important to brush and to get caught in the brush. But it sounds like aligners are even more important than brackets and bands, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, And while we have that like gingival inflammation difference between the aligners, they really, it still happens with aligners. Um, I do Mm -hmm. find that something called airflow gets underneath all the the gingiva and really helps clean it out. Um, We also, you know, they always say, oh, aligners, teeth are, teeth are healthier with aligners. They're not, they're not. The only difference is we can take x-rays more easily and you can take them off to brush, but if they're not doing what is necessary, it's actually far more detrimental to the teeth than actual brackets. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, I wish I could go on and talk more, but we're at the end of our time. So thank you so much for enlightening us today. And thanks for being with us on Pedo Teeth Talk. My pleasure. Thank you so much. And thank you to our audience for listening in. We'll see you here next time. Do you need additional CE hours, but don't have time to travel to courses? Did you attend annual session and want to listen to the audio recordings? Check out AAPD's new Education Passport. The redesigned and improved Education Passport is AAPD's online learning center where you can earn CE and listen to audio recordings from all of our continuing education courses and more. Visit educationpassport.aapd.org for more information. For 10% off any product, use discount code TEETHTALK in the Education Passport store. Pedo Teeth Talk is the show that delivers cutting-edge ideas for the professional specializing in pediatric dentistry. Be sure to check out previous episodes of Pedo Teeth Talk, as well as our other podcast platform, Newly Erupted. All previous episodes are available on our website. We welcome your ideas for future shows and guests. For more information on the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, visit aapd.org.